So we spent an afternoon talking with Robin Kimmerer. She said in the indigenous worldview, humans are not the only kind of people. There are maple people, there are oriole people, there are cloud people. And we were sit sitting under a maple tree, and so I asked if it's possible to explain the personhood of a maple tree using scientific language. And she said, and I'm quoting here, the question of how we explain things takes us down a different path. It gets at the question of what we view as valid knowledge. Could I prove to you with scientific instruments the sentience of this maple? No. There are, of course, emerging tools that tell you all about the electrochemical gradients in this maple and the degree of sophistication in which the tree senses, behaves, makes decisions in the world that are beyond our knowing. But science only privileges the intellect. It doesn't allow us to take in emotional intelligence or spiritual intelligence. But that doesn't mean those things don't exist. Hi, I'm Steve Paulson, the executive producer of To the Best of Our Knowledge, which is a podcast and a syndicated public radio show out of Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm also just starting to work on a new podcast series with my radio partner and wife and Strange Champs about kinship with the more than human world, with animals, plants, mountains, and rivers, and, and what it would actually mean to take this idea of kinship seriously. So I went down the rabbit hole really rather deeply, and one of the places I landed was in the plant world, and what is uh, sort of starting to be called, there's sort of an emerging field of vegetal consciousness. Of course, this is all highly speculative, gets pretty weird, especially the psychedelic part. And, and yes, I know mushrooms are not actually plants, but for the sake of this talk, I'm just going to talk about them all together. Um, so let's talk about magic mushrooms for a few minutes. Um, the first thing to know is that they go way back in human history. People have been eating them and tripping and uh, worshiping mushrooms for centuries, prob probably for thousands of years. No one knows exactly how long hallucinogenic mushrooms have been eaten because the archaeological record is very thin. It's hard to preserve this material. Um, but every so often, a new piece of evidence surfaces. So there is a cave in Spain with pictographs dating back 6,000 years, and they kind of look like mushrooms. Um, and just recently, a 1,000-year-old shaman's bag was found in Bolivia with a special pouch containing uh, trace substances of psychoactive psychoactive compounds, including DMT and possibly psilocybin, which is the chemical compound in magic mushrooms. There are also stones, big and small, carved into the shape of mushrooms that have been found all over Central America. And we know this, uh, some of this history from the conquistadors. When they first got to Guatemala and Mexico in the 16th century, they found people using magic mushrooms in their religious ceremonies as a sacrament. These mushrooms were called the flesh of the gods, which of course is what Christians considered their sacrament in the Eucharist, the flesh of God. So the Spanish Catholics flipped out. I mean, this was incredibly threatening because this was a sacrament that really worked. I mean, you did not need faith to see God. You ate these mushrooms and, and you met God. Um, so the conquistadors brutally suppressed all of these ceremonial and shamanic practices. They tortured people. They destroyed the mushroom stones. And this entire ritual about the sacred mushroom was crushed and went underground. And for centuries, Westerners, travelers, anthropologists didn't really know about it. It was just kind of a rumor until much later, one man, Gordon Wasson, a banker, actually he was a vice president at J.P. Morgan, became obsessed with the stories about these mushroom cults. He came up with a theory about the origin of religion, that it was rooted in transcendent experience be coming out of uh, the consumption of psychedelic mushrooms, not just in Central America, but in Siberia. Um, he even thought the Eleusian mysteries in ancient Greece had sort of a fungus component to it. And if you think about it, it's maybe not so weird. I mean, there's an unseen world, an unearthly realm where maybe you can meet your ancestors, the line between life and death can get a little blurry. It is very powerful stuff. So Gordon Wasson heard these rumors that sacred mushroom rituals were actually still around. Um, and so he became obsessed with trying to find them. And so he went to Mexico something like 11 times um, before he actually found uh, this, this healer, Marina Sabina, in 1955, who let him take part in her ceremonial practice in a remote village near Oaxaca it blew his mind. And later he wrote about this experience in a 17-page article 
in Life magazine, which is only possible because the publisher of Life was Henry Luce, who was an avid user and supporter of psychedelics. This history is amazing when you start digging into it. So, so Wasson's rediscovery of magic mushrooms, at least for Westerners, along with Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD, ignited the scientific, uh, the, the psychedelic revolution, and we kind of know what happened there. You know, went overboard, was suppressed, went underground. And there was one person in the 80s and 90s who kind of kept the psychedelic flame alive, the ethnobotanist and legendary psychonaut Terence McKenna, who traveled all over the world studying and experimenting with a whole range of hallucinogens. McKenna was a storyteller, and people loved to hear him talk, and he loved to entertain people. And he came up with a wild idea that eating mushrooms led directly to the origins of human consciousness. Essentially, the mushroom made us human, and he called this the stoned ape theory, which goes something like this. If you look back over our evolutionary history, there was an explosive expansion of the hominid brain. Uh, there was, over the course of about two million years, the brain expanded about three times in size, and something made this happen. The question is what? Now, according to the stoned ape theory, eating magic mushrooms was the triggering factor that basically transformed us from advanced hominids into a conscious, self-reflective thinking human being. Of course, this is totally unproven, but there is a kind of crazy logic here. Terence McKenna died nearly 20 years ago, but his younger brother, Dennis McKenna, is still very much around. He traveled with Terence on a lot of their sort of wild psychedelic adventures. Dennis actually told me that he, not Terence, is the one who came up with the idea of the stoned ape theory, maybe a little sibling rivalry there. Um, his idea is that when you're on a psychedelic trip, especially on mushrooms, you experience synesthesia, um, the crosstalk between the senses. So, for instance, you can see sounds, you can visualize abstractions, and in McKenna's theory, this gave our ancestors the capacity for imaginative thinking. Dennis believes that this is the key to the origins of language, which he actually thinks is an act of synesthesia, because it allows you to link a meaningless sound with a symbol that has meaning. So according to the stoned ape theory, mushrooms jump-started the human brain and gave us language. <laughs> now, I've asked a lot of people what they think about the stoned ape theory. Michael Pollan, who wrote the best-selling book about psychedelics, considers it completely implausible. The British neuroscientist Robin Carhart Harris, one of the leading experts in the world on psychedelics, calls it a fascinating idea, kind of spine chilling, but highly unlikely. For one thing, he says it's not at all clear that every pre-human culture actually ate mushrooms with uh, psilocybin. So my take on the stoned ape theory is that historically it's probably rather improbable, but it might be we might be asking the wrong question there. Instead of looking back into history, maybe we should look forward. And if what people say about psychedelics is that they can open up the mind in new ways to imagine new possibilities, who knows? Maybe, maybe psilocybin and other psychedelics has a place. And, and Robin Carhart Harris's research might offer some clues. So he believes that tripping is like hitting a reset button in the brain. It knocks out the default network of how we normally think. And instead, we get a disordered, almost scrambled brain, what he calls the entropic brain, which allows us to make new and original neural connections. So the usual way, the usual take on psychedelics is that these are very powerful chemicals that activate different neural pathways in the brain, which gives us these mind-blowing experiences, which is all true. But I'm going to suggest a conceptual shift here. Kind of think of this as a thought experiment Maybe this is not just about brain chemistry, but an encounter with another being, a mushroom, that may have its own intelligence, its own subjective experience. So let's leave psychedelics for a little bit here. I'll, I'll come back to them later. Turn more generally to plants, because there are a few big questions here. Can we actually call them intelligent? intelligent? Is intelligence even possible if there's no brain, no neurons? This is a very lively and controversial area of uh, debate among scientists. There's even a new field of what's called plant neurobiology, which a lot of botanists think is it's sort of a ridiculous idea. But there is also some fascinating research. The Italian ecologist Monica Galliano did an experiment with mimosa peducus, commonly known as touch-me-nots, because their leaves fold inward as soon as you touch them as a defense against being attacked. So she dropped 
56 of these potted plants uh, a few inches above a cushioned surface, and they all closed up when they hit the ground. Then every five seconds she would do it again. She'd drop them and drop them again, and more and more stopped closing, and by the 60th drop, they had all stopped closing. She tried grabbing them, and they, they closed again, so it, that mechanism still worked. Um, so her takeaway was that once these plants learned that there was no real danger here, their defense mechanism no longer kicked in. And for her, this was a demonstration of learning and memory, which also triggered decision-making, to close or not to close. Galliano has done another experiment that seems to show that plants can actually hear running water, and they even produce clicking noises, possibly in order to communicate what they're hearing. This research has changed Galliano's worldview. She says, I used to live in a world of objects, and now I live in a world of subjects. There's a growing body of scientific literature about plant intelligence, but if you really want to get a sense of all of this, I would suggest reading Richard Power's amazing novel, The Overstory, which won the Pulitzer Prize earlier this year. It's about as close as you can get to writing a novel from a, a tree's point of view. We had the Ents, yes, in Tolkien, but you know, not very science-based there. Richard Powers spent five years researching this novel. He read more than 100 books about trees. And when I asked him what he learned from all this research, he said, trees are social beings. They have memory. They talk to each other. And if you define intelligence as flexible, non-deterministic behavior that responds to a changing environment, then trees certainly are intelligent. To give a few examples. When trees are attacked by insects, they can produce their own insecticides. They send out chemicals, sort of like an air force, that attract other insects to come and eat the bugs that are attacking the tree. They also send out chemical signals through their root systems to other trees, basically saying, hey, watch out, I've been attacked. And this can uh, trigger the production of tannins in their leaves, which can be poisonous to animals. There's also a symbiotic relationship between tree roots and fungi, which is maybe even more amazing. Um, to take one example, these fungi make little nooses out of their filaments and trap and digest invertebrates and then feed these nutrients back into the tree. The mycelium can also facilitate communication between, different, be, between trees of different species. Richard Powers says this is like a shared immune system which turns a forest into a kind of superorganism. And I might add that this is completely outside the usual neo-Darwinian view of evolution, where every organism is, you know, is competing with its neighbors. Trees are, of course, amazing for all kinds of reasons. They, some of them live a very long time. There are bristlecone pines that uh, can be, uh, live up to five to 6,000 years. And I was, I was recently in Sequoia National Park, actually right after I read the Richard Powers book, partly because I had read it. And, uh, and there was one time that I was standing in a cluster of uh, maybe a half a dozen giant sequoias. And each of them was over 1,000 years old. And I started, I started thinking about this. And I realized, you know, they obviously have been communicating with each other. They have been living essentially like a family. And it just sort of ch sent chills through me. When I asked Richard Powers why he wrote his novel, he said he wanted to create empathy for trees. So plants clearly have some sort of awareness, and they can transmit various kinds of information, but do they actually have consciousness? Do they have self-awareness? Is there such a thing as a plant self? Most scientists, of course, think this is ridiculous to even sort of consider this, but not all of them. In fact, there is an emerging literature from scientists, philosophers, and anthropologists with book titles like how forests think. Plants as persons of philosophical botany. Thus spoke the plant. And plant thinking, a philosophy of vegetal life. So here's another thought experiment. Would it be possible to think of the beingness of a plant? Let's say there's a tree growing next to your house. Can you imagine that tree having its own experience? That it, it's, it feels like something to be a tree. You might consider this the personhood of a tree. In fact, there's a movement among indigenous groups to grant legal rights to nature. Two years ago, a New Zealand river was granted the same legal rights as a human being. A local Maori tribe had fought for the recognition of this river, which is central to their cosmology. And where I'm from in Wisconsin, the Ho-Chunk Nation has amended its tribal constitution to include rights of nature, saying ecosystems and natural communities within the Ho-Chunk territory possess an inherent fundamental and inalienable right to exist and thrive. The hope is that the, this would allow the tribe to legally prohibit 
frack sand mining and the extraction of fossil fuels. So this past summer, Anne and I uh, went to visit Robin Wall Kimmerer just outside of her farm in Syracuse, New York, and it was a sort of remarkable experience. Robin is both a PhD botanist and a member of the citizen Potawatomi nation. So she brings together these two paradigms, these two ways of knowing, you know, scientific knowledge and indigenous wisdom, and she really comes up with sort of a new way of thinking about plants. And she's written a wonderful book called Braiding Sweetgrass. She talks about the grammar of animacy, and one of the striking things about the Potawatomi language is that most of its words are verbs, whereas in English it's mostly nouns. So we talk about that river, that object, whereas the Potawatomi might talk about rivering, or if they encounter a bear, it would be bearing. It's an active, ongoing process that does not regard mountains or birds or plants as objects, but rather as subjects. As Robin writes, personhood is extended to all who breathe and some who don't. And it's worth mentioning that Potawatomi was also one of the languages that was suppressed when native children were rounded up and sent off to Christian boarding schools, in, obviously in an effort to eradicate their native language and culture. So we spent an afternoon talking with Robin Kimmerer. She said, in the indigenous worldview, humans are not the only kind of people. There are maple people, there are oriole people, there are cloud people. And we were sitti sitting under a maple tree, and so I asked if it's possible to explain the personhood of a maple tree using scientific language. And she said, and I'm quoting here, the question of how we explain things takes us down a different path. It gets at the question of what we view as valid knowledge. Could I prove to you with scientific instruments the sentience of this maple? No. There are, of course, emerging tools that tell you all about the electrochemical gradients in this maple and the degree of sophistication in which the tree senses, behaves, makes decisions in the world that are beyond our knowing. But science only privileges the intellect. It doesn't allow us to take in emotional intelligence or spiritual intelligence. But that doesn't mean those things don't exist. She talked about plant blindness how so few people today can identify you know, more than, say, five or ten species of plants, whereas a couple of generations ago, it was commonplace that people could identify dozens. And she said, and I'm quoting again, the ability to sense what's going on around you with all these other intelligences seems very foreign to us today, as if it's some crazy supernatural thing to listen to or talk to trees. But we're told in our traditional knowledge that everybody used to be able to do that. There were many among us who could listen to what the trees and the birds had to say, but we've forgotten because we, we think we're the only ones with consciousness. Once you open yourself to that and learn to use those muscles again, the whole world changes." End quote. Robin Kimmerer talks about plants as teachers, and that's an idea that I've also heard from some people who've gone on uh, certain psychedelic uh, trips, and one of them is a guy named Jeremy Narby. He was a young Marxist anthropologist who went to Peru, uh, to the Peruvian Amazon in the mid-80s to research how indigenous people were losing their land rights. And he ended up living with the Ashaninka Indians who kept talking about their ability to communicate with plants. And he, he couldn't figure out what they were talking about. And so he kept asking questions until they finally said, you won't understand until you drink ayahuasca. And ayahuasca, if you didn't know, is a brew that is uh, made by mixing two completely different plants together. And there's a huge mystery about, you know, whoever thought to, you know, mix these two plants together. I mean, the tradition is that the plants told them that. Um, so Jeremy drank the brew, and it turned his world upside down. He had visions of the vegetal and the human worlds blending into each other, and he saw two huge fluorescent serpents sort of rising up above him who told him, you are just a tiny human being. You need to let go of your limited worldview. So Jeremy asked local shamans, what should I make of these visions? And they said, plants and animals are like humans, but the only way to get inside this other species to communicate with them is that you have to enter into this sort of altered state of consciousness. They said the spirit of the plant was talking to him. The plant was his teacher. So did the plant actually talk to Jeremy Narby? I mean, I have no idea. It seems pretty far-fetched. And you can very easily go down the rabbit hole when you start hearing people talk about their psychedelic experiences. I've, I've heard a lot of this. Um, Narby himself says he is agnostic about whether he had encountered some kind of plant consciousness, 
but he is absolutely convinced that there is no clear dividing line between the human and non-human worlds, between nature and culture. So I want to come back to the idea of kinship with the more than human world. I mean, if we really believe that plants are kin, what does that mean for us? Well, for one thing, we might feel less isolated in the world. There is a phrase that I really like. It's uh, called species loneliness as a way to describe how we've been cut off with, with the rest of the world. And there's also an ethical component to this whole discussion. To go back to Robin Kimberer, she says, when you see the trees and the crops as persons, you can't just take. You have to show respect to that person. You have to ask permission. You have to negotiate a trade. There has to be reciprocity. Kinship means you have relationships that carry consequences and bring obligations. A kinship network is not strictly a sort of a, a, a biological relationship. It's about expanding our sense of connectedness. It's really about redefining what we mean by family. There's another way to think about this. There's an African philosophy called Ubuntu that offers an entirely different way to conceptualize personal identity. It's, it's the opposite of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. The idea in Ubuntu is that your sense of self is shaped by your relationships with others, people and non-human beings. It begins with the premise that I am only because we are. You might see this as sort of a counterweight to the kind of individualism that is so common in our own culture. So what do we do with these stories from indigenous traditions, from psychedelics, from the plant biologists who were pushing the edges of scientific knowledge? There are some obvious pitfalls, cultural appropriation, of reading psychedelic experiences too literally, of believing something just because you want to. But I would suggest there are also problems with assuming that if science cannot explain something, then it is not real. And that is clearly a mistake. It's much more intellectually honest, I think, to just say, we don't know a lot. And frankly, that includes whether plants have some kind of inner life. And to me, it seems like a mistake to assume that a plant is just the sum total of a bunch of biochemical reactions. We just don't know. Thank you. Are you. Is, to the best of our knowledge, doing a series on plant communication? Are you writing a book? Um, where, where is this? Um, we are doing, so Anne and I are starting to work on a podcast series that would be kind of sort of a one-off from To the Best of Our Knowledge. So a lot of this material will end up on the radio show, but we want to do a series of episodes that are sort of directly talking about this, these ideas of kinship. And we're partnering with a, a nonprofit group in Chicago called the Center for Humans and Nature. <laughs> And they are actually Center for Humans and Nature, which okay. is a wonderful group. They have a website that sort of is rich with a lot of this material, like Robin Kimmerer does a lot of work with them. And uh, they are actually applying for some grants um, that would help us to um, sort of dive down this rabbit hole of the Kinship Project. And so it might be a series that would go on for ideally for a few years. And we're, we're trying to, I mean, our great struggle is to figure out you know, how do we do this weekly radio show and then to do a, a a podcast series on the side. There, you know, there'd be connections, but they're not just the same thing. Right. How did you get interested in this? What's your, what's your plant story? Oh. Go ahead. I was an English major in college, you know, like <laughs> half the people who went into public radio. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, how did I get into it? Um, I sort of, I, I, there's, I mean, there's sort of the, there's the radio path of, you know, I worked on this show called To the Best of Our Knowledge that was, it's all about kind of exploring ideas. It's about curiosity, and that sort of fits kind of, you know, my own sort of search. And then there's kind of a more personal side where I have sort of a larger project of, um, I guess it's sort of in search of what I would call transcendent experience in a, in a more of a secular culture. And, and I would like to write a book about some of this stuff, not just about this, but there are, I, I'm, I'm fascinated sort of by, you know, bumping against, up against the edges of what science can tell us. And then there seem to be a lot of experiences where, you know, science has a really hard time explaining this, but it's, these are very powerful experiences. So psychedelic experiences would be one. Um, uh, near death experience is, is really fascinating if you kind of go down there. And some of what people say in the more animistic cultures, is, so it's like some, bringing some of these kinds of things together and sort of yeah, synthesizing it. So that's kind of a personal passion of mine. What, what are people saying about us consuming, consuming
Yeah, I mean, there are sort of the obvious environmental issues, like, you know, cutting down old growth forests. Um, it's worth mentioning that Richard Powers, who wrote the overstory, he actually he moved to the Smoky Mountains be because of the experience of sort of doing all of this research, because he wanted to live sort of near an old growth forest. So there are sort of those kind of ethical questions. Um, there are, we just did another show on, to the best of our knowledge, about ancient seeds. And there, you know, what has happened with, um, if there's, you know, so many of our major crops are essentially monocrops. I mean, there are just very few varieties of the flour that we eat, for instance. And there is an argument, actually, that the reason why there's so much gluten intolerance now is because we've become very dependent on, you know, one or two varietals of grain. And that, and sort of, you know, it, people didn't used to be so, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, gluten, gluten intolerance. I mean, so, you know, so intolerant to gluten. So um, there is, uh, there's sort of a move to um, expand our, our seed bank. Um, that would be another sort of ethical um, piece of this. And, I mean, there's, you, know, you can sort of play out a lot of the, the obvious environmental um, questions about, you know, cutting back on pesticides. And, but I don't mean, maybe Is anyone maybe, talking about like, not eating uh, mushrooms or, or asparagus or something anymore because of the Well, you got to eat stuff to live. <laughs> I mean, it's actually, it raises an interesting question. I mean, do you, uh, I'm not going to get into questions about vegetarianism here, but um, one response to, oh, it's like, you know, you should never kill animals is, you know, well, you also have to kill plants to eat. And, you know, there, but, but you have to, I mean, you have to eat. And I think someone like Robin Kimmer would say, you know, you do it. You do it with respect. I live in Germany, and there's this um, a German writer called Peter Bolleben. I don't know if you know him yet. Yeah. He wrote these two, uh, it's a trilogy, kind of, a, right. of covering these things. One is called The Secret Network of, of Nature, and it kind of touches on, on a lot of the things that you've been talking about. Why do you think that is? Like, Why do you think these books became, they're huge bestsellers in, in Germany. And I, They were bestsellers think, here, too, yeah, in the yeah, US. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, why do you think that is? Why not? Because we've been so cut off with the, from the natural world. Yeah, but it seems still something right now. I don't. Uh, you don't think there's anything else? Or? Well, I think there was a period. That, so there was a book that came out in maybe the '70s called *The Secret Life of Plants*, which yeah. was a big bestseller, and that sort of held up as this is what was wrong about how this was all written. It's like, you know, kind of a lot of pseudoscience there. And then what has happened more recently is, I mean, a lot of the research that I cited, this is new. I mean, this is, a lot of this is in the last decade or two. And so it's now to write those kinds of books. It's not just, oh, it's like, you know, this flight of the imagination. I mean, a lot of this is science-based. And, yeah. and I mean, what I'm suggesting here is there's sort of, there's the science and then there are some things that are suggested that kind of go beyond the science, and that's where you get into some of these other traditions, whether it's indigenous traditions or, you know, what people say on psychedelics. So, but anyway, I think I think it's a response to we've just been so cut off yeah. from the natural. I mean, we're missing something in our lives. For a rhetorical, like the secret life of to frame things as like plants are keeping secrets from us, and like we we just need to find out, or like we don't understand. Instead of, right, they, there are so many systems in the world that exist and we don't understand them. It's not like a secret. Yeah, but if you are tuning into a podcast and you see the title <laughs> and the secret, which are you going to listen to? The Secret Life of Plants or, yeah, there are all these communicate these systems. <laughs> of the body, it's like, you know, so some of it is just marketing. I, I don't really have a problem with that, as long as it's, you know, the, there's a solid intellectual base there. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Thank you yeah, so much for coming. Yeah.